Cole White is a project leader with Enough Already, which is a very uh, interesting multi-stakeholder coalition uh, here in the province. So that was launched in 2020, uh, providing incredibly uh, useful and uh, well-regarded resources to uh, a very diverse uh, um, interest in communities. Uh, their mandate is really to help with awareness on sexual harassment in Saskatchewan workplaces. So with that, Nicole, I know we have a busy uh, schedule that uh, you're going to try to give us a lot of great information. And um, as we go through it, if there's anything that you want to add about Enough Already, please do so. So Wonderful. I'll let you well, take it away. Thank you so and much. I, yeah, everybody I think is muted. Uh, if you just make sure everybody else is muted that's on the call, that would be great. Okay. I, I want to thank you very much for the invitation to speak uh, this this afternoon. Uh, I had a great conversation with Jocelyn, and we just uh, <laughs> uh, we got along uh, like kindred spirits. And I was very excited to, with the possibility and potential of chatting with you here today. So I'm a. Uh, I want to acknowledge that we're meeting with you today on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis, and we work together today with the spirit of reconciliation. So uh, a little bit of, I guess, I guess I've already popped into my objectives, but um, I've been working in community and working with marginalized communities, specifically around uh, women and gender issues and uh, empowering marginalized populations. So this work was really meaningful for me. I am a registered social worker. That's my uh, day job. We also have a, a number of HR specialists that support us in our work. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, later. So we're gonna be going through what is enough already and uh, talk about harassment. What does it look like in Saskatchewan? We're gonna explore microaggressions, lateral violence, and then we're gonna talk about strategies on how to be a good role model, excuse me, a, a bystander in the workplace. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate to put them in the chat or um, if things come up, just, uh, just let me know. So I'm gonna ask you just to try and put your phones away and try and be present for the remainder of the hour. I'm sure this uh, time together is gonna to fly by. And before we begin, I just wanna remind everyone that we are gonna be talking about sexual harassment. So please take care of yourself if something comes up for you within this presentation. Uh, and we are going to be recording this session. Um, so uh, just so everyone is again aware of that. I think we're all aware of that. I think um, Zoom has that very audible like notification when that record button gets hit. So that's helpful for us. Um, yeah, so please take care of yourself. Um, and as I said before, I am a registered social worker. Um, so if anyone needs to chat after the presentation, I, I'm happy to stay on the line a little later if anyone wants to debrief or if anything does pop up. Um, um, and I know this work is not easy, so I, I really do appreciate you prioritizing this conversation as an organization. My hope is that we can identify some strategies that we can all utilize to be better allies to one another and to support each other in the work ahead. I always have to remind everyone that what follows is not legal advice. I'm mandated to say that there are tons of lawyers on this project. So that is a part of my official introduction as well. And uh, some of those lawyers uh, come from these partners. So um, this partnership coalition came together to apply for dollars through Justice Canada. So they include the Saskatchewan Chamber of Commerce, the Sexual Assault Services of Saskatchewan, Saskatoon Industry Education Council, the Saskatchewan Human Rights Commission, and Create Justice out of the College of Law at the University of Saskatchewan. So our, our role, as already articulated, is to combat sexual harassment in Saskatchewan workplaces, and we are fully funded to do that work through Justice Canada. Our main mandate is to create the space to talk about it, destigmatize the reporting of sexual harassment, and dispel misconceptions and misunderstandings about sexual harassment in the workplace. We recognize that sexual harassment is disrespectful, discriminatory, damaging, and demoralizing, and can negatively affect a person's mental health and can cause irreparable harm in the workplace. Along with the support of people who've experienced sexual harassment in the workplace, the coalition's project charter also focuses on a broad fact-based workplace education campaign to eradicate misinformation around sexual harassment. We want to train employees and employers and increase public awareness and provide access to employment coaching for those who've experienced sexual harassment in the workplace. 
honestly, we sort of like did a scan of what we have available in Saskatchewan and, and tried to really create uh, res resources to respond to those gaps. Um, so that's really what we've tried to do. So I'm sure some of this is not going to be surprising. It, we always have to include it just so everyone is on the same page. So as outlined within the Saskatchewan Human Rights Commission, uh, the code of 2018, there are two types of harassment. So harassment on prohibited grounds as uh, listed above here. <coughs> And examples of sexual harassment include sexual remarks, jokes with overtones, a sexual advance or invitation, displaying of offensive materials, leering, threats, unwanted physical touch, and sexual assault, excuse me, sexual and physical assault. And then personal harassment is sometimes referred to as bullying and can include the behavior that adversely affects the worker's psychological or physical well-being where the perpetrator should have known it would cause humiliation or intimidation. So I know when I think of WCB and OHS, I think of like how to lift a table properly and you know that physical safety in a workplace and they've really started to branch out and recognize the impact of a psychological safety in a workplace. So this is really where that personal harassment piece sit, fits in. So examples of that personal harassment uh, include verbal or written abuse or threats, insulting or degrading comments, strokes or gestures, personal ridicule, unjustifiable interference with another's work, work sabotage, refusing to work with others and interference with or a vandalism of personal property. And one of the two main myths I always like to cover is um, work-related sexual harassment only occurs in the workplace. And I'm sure many of us are not in a physical, typical workplace right now. Uh, sexual harassment covers incidents that occur at work and during work hours. However, sexual harassment can occur outside the usual workplace or work hours at work-sponsored social events, during work video conferencing, Zoom meetings, conferences, and other occasions that are occasionally connected to a worker's employment. And workplace sexual harassment only happens between supervisors and employees. Whenever I tell somebody about my work, there's this like, frequently people bring up like mad men and like older supervisor and like young intern. That's kind of the physical, that's what people think about when uh, they think about sexual harassment. That's not always the case. So it can be coworkers, supervisors, employers. Workplace sexual harassment can also include harassment by clients, contractors, or members of the public that arises during the course of the worker's employment. And why are we doing this work? People are like, come on, it's 2021. People don't do this anymore. Uh, that is absolutely not the case. And if anyone has had the opportunity to read Jocelyn's uh, thesis, that is absolutely not the case. We've got tons and tons of work to do on this issue. So in 2019, we did a province-wide survey to sort of have baselines for our project to sort of measure, um, measure where people are at and where we're starting from. So 40% of Saskatchewan residents had experienced harassment or know someone who had experienced harassment. We actually did a survey just last year and actually the number went up to 41%. Um, yeah, so we absolutely have a, a lot of work to do in this area. And the, the stat that really has framed a lot of our work, and I alluded to it earlier, is recognizing that 71% of Saskatchewan people have limited knowledge as to what to do after they see or experience sexual harassment. So what are the supports in place? What are the options? What are their next steps available out there? So we really tried to build those resources to address those knowledge gaps. This is where we're hoping to empower you with knowledge and skills and resources today. And um, so occupational health and safety between 2016 and 2018, uh, if you look at their numbers, they had 408 harassment investigations within a two year period. That breaks down to uh, approximately one harassment claim per working day. Um, and we all know that the amount of formal complaints come forward is just a drop in the bucket in regards to the actual harassment that's happening on a daily basis. In March 2020, 10% of all formalized human rights complaints in Saskatchewan alleged sexual harassment. 
We also want to talk a little bit about uh, microaggressions and lateral violence because uh, while it's not included in the code, um, it also sort of provides us some context to some deeper conversations. I'm sure as we walk through these slides, uh, almost all of you are going to be like, yes, I've experienced this. Yes, I've seen this. Or yes, I've done this. And none of us are perfect. And I think there's always opportunities for us to learn and grow together. So uh, microaggression is a statement, action, or incident regarded as an instance of indirect, subtle, or unintentional discrimination against members of vulnerable populations. So these vulnerable populations that we particularly want to get this information to include women, people with disabilities, young people entering or preparing to enter the workforce, Indigenous people, newcomers, visible minorities, and the 2SLGBTQ community. Um, and we recognize that when there's that instances of intersectionality, there's even more barriers to coming forward. There are even more barriers to speaking up. And you know, when it comes to our young workers, research shows that if a young person experiences sexual harassment in their first job, they understand that to be a norm in a workplace. So anytime we can sort of stop that cycle in its tracks and let people know about their rights and expectations of that, that can be really helpful in breaking those cycles. So um, microaggressions are unconscious prejudices, beliefs may be demonstrated consciously or unconsciously, may appear harmless to observers, though it can be considered a form of covert racism, sexism, or just plain offensive. Sometimes can repeat or affirm stereotypes about the minority group or subtly demean its members. So examples of microaggressions. Where are you actually from? Are you an intern? You look so young. Your name is so hard to pronounce. Can I just call you Q? Um, one that I always like to talk about is when uh, people refer to women as girls, that can be really problematic. Um, like we have a new girl starting today, you girls have a good lunch. Um, you never ever hear men say, how's the boy doing on the job over there, right? So there's that infantilization and sort of like that subtle way of cutting down somebody's power and ability. This type of concept comment is quite insidious. Well, it's potentially meant to be a compliment, it can be quite backhanded, and the recipients may be confused as to how to respond. So misunderstanding um, or joke could be blown out of proportion. It's really okay and important to remember the impact on someone. If it offends someone, then it's not okay. Uh, it's feedback and learning that's important for you to understand the impact of your actions. And the way we use words changes the way we frame things in our mind. When we describe adult women with a, a word like uh, what we use to describe children, it, it changes the way we view women, even unconsciously, to not equate them to an adult um, could imply that they're inferior to men. So, um, you're a pretty good welder for a woman. You women are so sensitive. Uh, men refusing to wash dishes because it's women's work. I forwarded it to this piece earlier. And lateral violence uh, takes on a number of different toxic behaviors and it's any action that is meant to discourage or make a person feel bad in the workplace. In its extreme form, lateral violence can be conscious or deliberate acts of meanness with the overall intent to harm, hurt, or induce fear. So um, there are a lot of examples of what lateral violence looks like. Um, you can walk through. Lateral violence can also be referred to as workplace incivility. I'm not sure if folks are uh, familiar with one term over the other. Um, so more instances, sending a nasty demeaning note, talking about someone behind their back, emotional put downs, disrespecting workers by comments, gestures, or behaviors. Um, some of these uh, may feel familiar to some of the folks on, on the call when somebody uh, constantly interrupts or talking over someone in a meeting or making dismissive comments or speaking disrespectfully while not saying anything that could cause legal action. I think uh, I, it's not a formal term, but mansplaining would also uh, slide quite nicely into this piece as well. So um, other examples of lateral violence, making accusations of professional competence, giving public reprimands, insults to others, giving silent treatment, emotional tirades or losing one's temper. So how you combat uh, lateral violence is really about modeling good behavior and to not make excuses. We've got to hold everyone accountable all day, every day and 
um, you can define what that acceptable conduct is. And this is some of the languages for employers in particular around this, but you can hire and train for civility. And, and to recognize that, you know, pay attention to the larger world, current events impact workplace behavior. Behavior, For instance, when rudeness is displayed by public figures on TV, social media, and at public events, it can become normalized. Um, and, you know, three to six months later, that incivility tends to bubble up at work, too. If you don't address workplace incivility swiftly, you can likely end up dealing with its after effects through turnover, low morale, and productivity gaps. Language matters. Words have meaning. If, in, if unintended, words have an impact on our unconscious. So like to just to ask everyone to just take a moment and to invite everyone to think about things of whether there are microaggressions that potentially you say, whether intentional or unintentional, and consider the impact it may have on someone. I uh, typically have, um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with Mentimeter. I just couldn't get it to function for today and I'm really pretty sad about that. It's an online polling that I usually do uh, a poll with folks so sort of reflecting on your own experience. So before we dive into the bystander work, I wanna sit back and reflect, You know, what are some of the common reasons people may not act if they saw harassment happening in a workplace? So some of those main, um, responses that I've heard is that maybe they have a fear of retribution. Maybe you're scared of the harassment turning on you or nobody else is doing anything. Why should I do anything? Maybe you don't know enough of the context of the situation. I'm scared I'll be labeled a troublemaker. I don't know what else to do, which is an extremely reasonable place to be. Um, and and the I always like to add the, another reason because who's to say there might be something else entirely going on. So just think about what is the reason if you saw harassment happening, what is the main reason why you may not want to step up? Now, we're going to talk a little bit about strategies on how uh, to be a bystander in the workplace. Um, and, and recognizing that there may still be reasons that I ha haven't articulated, maybe a reason why you don't want to speak come forward. So please know that there is no judgment in regards to how you navigate a situation. This type of training and conversation is really meant to be an opportunity to explore options. Uh, thinking about that one response of like, I don't know what to do. Hopefully we'll give folks uh, some options and some ideas as to move forward when you see uh, something going down in a workplace. And the work that we do, you know, we have a lens of addressing sexual harassment in the workplace, but these strategies are really great for addressing ageism, sexism, homophobia, racism, any type of that type of behavior that you're seeing in the workplace. So it is, um, it's got a, a few different ways that you could be utilizing uh, these strategies. So um, we actually launched a bystander campaign just last September, um, you know, in the middle of a pandemic um, to sort of get people talking about this and thinking about this. Um, we recognize that we can all be a part of uh, responding to sexual harassment in the workplace and that it can be everyone's responsibility, not just um, managers and employees and supervisors. It's important for everyone to understand their roles and how we can collectively create a healthy and productive workplace. So before we get started, I, I want us to think back to a workplace scenario that you wish you would handle differently. I think we all have one. Um, I don't know where any of us are coming from today, so I want us to just be gentle with ourselves. It's okay if we didn't get it right. Um, as Maya Angelou says, uh, when you know better, you do better. And hopefully we'll all do a little better after today's conversation. I also don't want, I want to acknowledge that I don't know who is on the call today. So if you're a leader or a supervisor within a scenario, you have a responsibility to act and to support the person being harassed. We're going to talk a little bit about scenarios and options, but they're really meant to be sort of like a peer-to-peer -peer basis. And I want to acknowledge that we're going to go through the full spectrum of options. So if we get to one that you're like, oh no. <laughs> This is something I would never ever do. Please just like hold tight and hopefully we'll find a, a, a solution and option that feels right for you. I see them all as toolboxes, uh, tools in our toolbox to have on the ready. 
So the main strategies that you can utilize for bystander intervention for us are intervening, uh, distracting, finding help, be supportive, and documenting. So we're going to go back to those uh, a little later, but those are our, our main pieces that we'll explore today. So the first thing you need to do is assess the situation and identify that something is happening that's not right. So is it safe to intervene? Is the person being sexually harassed? Are they in danger? Will intervening make the problem better or worse? Is there someone better suited to handle the situation? We recognize that people who do intervene may experience a harassment or even hostility. So I want to let, I always do the direct intervention first off the bat because uh, sometimes that will work for someone, um, but that may not be uh, the, the strategy that fits for you. And that is a okay. So um, if you were to directly intervene, uh, you can step in rather than aside. If it's safe and necessary to do so, you can directly intervene in the harassment, address the person doing the harassment, be firm, let them know their behavior is inappropriate. You can say, that's inappropriate, disrespectful, not okay. Leave them alone. Stop talking about that. It's offensive. Um, that may not be your style and that is a-okay. But just sort of going back to that one. So um, leave them alone. Stop talking about that. It's offensive. So this is where I'd like us to sort of, this is your tiny bit of homework for today. Um, research shows that if you actually practice some responses, you'll have them better, like they'll be in your long-term memory bank and you'll be able to pull them out quickly. I, I'm sure many of you on the call have experienced catcalling in, in your life at some point. And I don't know about you, but I never ever have the right response it always comes like a week and a half later in the middle of the night and you're like that is what I should have said that would have been the best response um that's kind of frustrating that you don't have it so that's kind of what I want to ask you to do I want you to think about are there some things that you could say um and I want you to practice them in a mirror I know that sounds silly but repeating them a few times can actually help you um have them be available to you in that moment. And it doesn't have to be huge. You don't have to step on uh, your soapbox uh, and call out social justice, bring about social justice uh, in all the land. It can be simple. Hey, that's not cool. Let's get back to work. Thinking about a short, concise way you can express your disapproval. And as I said, it doesn't have to be a lengthy teachable moment or humiliating the other person. It simply identifies that the comment or action is not okay for the person engaging the behavior and for those observing it. So one study examining responses to homophobic comments in the workplace found that the most effective type of confrontation was calm but direct. Hey, that's not cool. It can be an easy takeaway that can be used in a variety of settings. And if you're like, Nicole, I would never say the words, hey, that's not cool. It's okay. Figure out what the language is that works for you. Figure out what feels natural and organic coming out of your mouth as a response to something like that. A similar approach can be used for any type of harmful behavior from calling out someone for using offensive language to intervening when a colleague is rude to a coworker. Openly expressing disapproval clearly communicates what's acceptable and is an essential first step in creating those new social norms that we talked about earlier. You could also um, assume that a comment is sarcastic uh, and identify it as such. You could respond to a coworker refusing to wash dishes because it's women's work to say, what is this, the 1950s? Or you could make the discomfort about you and not them. You know, a close friend of mine was sexually assaulted, so I, I'm not a big fan of rape jokes. Um, you could be purposeful with your body language. Walk away from the conversation. Turn your back. Don't walk away. Walk, excuse me, don't laugh along with offensive jokes. Um, one thing that I forgot to mention earlier, and I think it's really important to articulate, is that if somebody is telling a joke and if somebody is laughing along, that doesn't mean it's laughing because they're agreeing with the joke. Sometimes laughter is a key coping mechanism to cover discomfort. And I'm sure we've all been there when you're like, <laughs> right? So just because someone is laughing, that doesn't mean they are uh, all in in regards to whatever that person is saying in that moment. So your homework for today is to brainstorm three different comeback responses that would feel okay for you and to practice them. You just want to embed them in your brain so they're ready for you when you need them in that moment. 
The other thing you could do if you're like, oh no, direct intervention is absolutely not my style, you could distract. You want to, you could run inter interference. If direct intervention is not an option, you could create a di distraction to help diffuse the situation. Instead of approaching the harasser, engage the person who's being harassed. You could literally completely ignore the harasser and engage that other person. Hey, you want to go for coffee? I think you've got a call. Somebody needs to talk to you in your office. What are those things that, you know how we joke that you would never let them take you to a second location? You could be the person taking the person to the second location to get them out of that scenario, to disrupt whatever's going on. You don't even have to acknowledge anything that's happening. You could actually just ask them a question, strike up a completely unrelated conversation, tell them the boss is looking for them. So that one's a little softer and a little easier, but extremely effective. The other piece, if you're like, I don't know that person who's being harassed, I don't know what to do. The other thing you can do, if you don't wanna get involved personally, find an appropriate third party to intervene. It could be a manager, supervisor, human resource professional, or another colleague. And you know, this pulls into that response of like, Maybe I don't know enough context to, to respond to what's going on. So pull in that third person and, and they, can, they can address it if you see that happening. The next piece is just as important as the other pieces. Talk to the person and, and it's being supportive. So talk to the person who's been harassed. If you weren't able to intervene, you can always support the person who experienced the harassment after the fact. Acknowledge what happened show empathy, ask them if they're okay, whether they need additional support, and let them know that that shouldn't have happened to them. You're available to talk to them when, you're there, when they're ready. This support role is incredibly important. Validating their experience and letting them know that they're not alone is just profoundly important. Because frequently when somebody experiences something, you can get stuck in a cycle of like, maybe I was reading into it. Maybe maybe something else happened. Maybe, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm not, yeah you know, seeing the, the situation appropriately. But if you have a third party who actually witnessed it, who can say, no, 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 that was not right. That can be extremely meaningful for someone who's been impacted by sexual harassment in the workplace and so profoundly powerful in their healing journey to know that they're not alone and that they were seen. So even that's not intervening at all, but can also be profoundly important. So the next step is, and it's extremely important, is I, I want you to record every detail you can think of. So the people there, who, were, who was present, what was said, time, date, location, as many details as humanly possible. More details, the better. And I want you to sign it, date it, and hold on to it for the long term. You never know. You know, if that person who experienced harassment, maybe they don't want to come forward. Um, but who's to say six months down the road, maybe that person's behavior escalates and they're finally ready to come forward. Because you've documented that situation, they actually have a paper trail to substantiate their claim. So that can be incredibly powerful for someone. You can let the person know who's been harassed that you have documented what occurred and precisely how you're going to store it. It's important you maintain their trust in this process. So make sure to let them know that you've done that and you have a copy of it and how you're going to be utilizing that. So the next step is to follow up with that person who's been harassed. Tell them you documented it, as I said, and, and ask what they would like you to do with that documentation. You can offer to go with them if they do decide to file a report. Let them know about us uh, enough already that we've got resources and information available to them. Um, we have flowcharts on how to file a complaint in, on our website at enoughalreadysk.ca. Um, and this is the one thing, you know, there are external options. If your internal processes don't work, um, and I'm not sure how this works with some mining companies, so I want to fully provide the context of like, um, this is, the Saskatchewan Human Rights Commission may not be the option for you, but um, I do want to articulate that if occupational health and safety, you can actually call them to have an investigation. Uh, the one caveat I always like to, to let folks know about is that you must remain employed during the duration of an investigation. Um, if you decide to quit, they're no longer able to pursue that complaint. So I always like to articulate that up front. 
So we have a few scenarios here, but I'm not sure if scenarios are really necessary today. Um, I'll fly through them really quick. I'm really looking forward to a little bit more conversation because you have so much wisdom and so much experience in this area. And I really look forward to sort of exploring some questions with you. So you're at work and you overhear a group of coworkers talking. You start to overhear multiple comments made by Sam on how tight Judy shirt is. You look over, she's present, and you can tell she's clearly uncomfortable. What do you do? So you can assess the situation you hear and recognize that it's harmful. If you decide to intervene, Sam, not appropriate. Leave Judy alone. Number two, you can distract, change the topic, ask a work-related question. Number three, find help. Find a supervisor or someone else who you think could help. Number four, be supportive. Find Judy after and ask if she's okay. And then finally, document. Scenario two, during a conversation about how best to proceed in a job site, Bob turns to Sarah and turn, starts using work terms in an inappropriate way. Um, how deep should we penetrate to drill? How deep do you, do you like it? Sarah is laughing along at the comments. Um, so as we've articulated before, just because Sarah's laughing doesn't mean she's in on the joke, doesn't mean that she feels comfortable with the line of questioning. And we all know the situations where somebody takes normal, normal <laughs> conversation that is work-related and makes it gross, right? It's all about tone and it's all about the context of how somebody is presenting information. So um, intervene, I don't think you should say those thing, kinds of things, it's not funny, distract, change the topic. You can find help, so find that supervisor, and be supportive to Sarah, ask if she's okay, and to document it. So um, this is kind of where I'd like to ask everyone who is on the call, if you wanna unmute, I'd like to ask, what are some strategies that you found that worked for you in particular scenarios that you saw something happening? Um, yeah. And, I, I understand I can only see a few of you right now, but it, I would like to ask, you know, what does allyship look like for you? What, what have been some instances that you felt were really effective in regards to shutting down crummy, crummy behavior that you saw happening in a workplace? Um, it's Marianne. I know there's been times, probably not so much in the workplace, but even just with the uh, family or whatever where something's been said and I and I look at them and go did that really just come out of your mouth and you just like did that really just come out of your mouth and then they kind of well well it's not appropriate I've done uh, what you've said, Nicole is going, or, you know, that's not okay. Or, and then also maybe even explain because sometimes um, some people go, but that's all, always the way it was. And I'm like, okay, well, this is a great coaching conversation that we're going to have then, right? <laughs> well, I think there's also the sense of like, well, that's how it was in my day. And it's like, yeah, your day. Not today, <laughs> not today. Thank you, I appreciate that. Sometimes with that, like a sexist joke or where they're trying to be funny in, in like a group, I like to not really play dumb, but do that, play dumb, ask the question. So I, I, I don't get it. Can you explain that to me? Like, how is that funny? I, I, don't, I don't get it. And then that gets them thinking. And when they start trying to explain how it's funny, they start to realize that maybe it's, not funny oh that's a good one that's great I think that ties into what what she was saying in regards to do you really mean to say that <laughs> like walk through your joke and tell me how that was that was okay was it that's a great idea And no pressure if, if folks aren't feeling comfortable enough to share too. I mean, that's a-okay. I think we've all come from different work environments where we've seen all sorts of things. And thankfully, and hopefully those, those situations are changing and we're doing a little better in regards to some of those, those areas. Um, I think uh, with the Me Too movement that there are conversations that are happening uh, 
in a more meaningful way for the first time in a long time. And I just, I just applaud all of you who are on the call. I think of, you know, women who are in mining, women in, 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 in the STEM areas. I just, you are blazing trails and, and breaking through those glass ceilings that existed before. And you're just, you have so much history and so much wisdom and so much deep, deep respect for all of you who are blazing trails for the women to come. So thank you very, very much. Does well, I'm not sure if you saw, there was a question in the chat. No, I haven't. Take a look. The chat just, yet. Okay. Um, I could read it to you, but it might be just quicker for you to read it. Yeah, for sure. And just throwing the question back and asking them to explain a certain, is that? Uh... Uh, nope. If you scroll up to the top, okay. I think. Oh, oh, there's been some good, good chat here. So currently the prolific sexual harassment in the military has come to the foray. I've been in the military and the mining community and the sexual harassment mainly by derogatory actions ha has been prevalent in the mining industry. Why is this still being covered by NDAs, et cetera? Uh, um, and the US are trying to do away with NDAs. Should Canada not do the same? It has been reported that women Equality has been set back by 50 years in the workplace due to COVID layoffs. Should this, should not this be addressed by policies and government? Whew. That's a, that is an extraordinary question you're putting forward. I definitely think that NDAs have been, again, I'm not speaking on behalf of uh, any organization, but only as an individual. Um, I think it's been so problematic because, you know, sometimes you will have uh, different corporations who have had multiple women who have had sign have signed NDAs and settled out of court, but are they actually creating the change within the organization to actually create a safer workplace? So there's less harassment that are happening in the workplace. Um, I think we, we've got a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. And I think it requires us having each other's backs and supporting people when they come forward, when they're talking about those experiences. Um, yeah, a lot of work to do. Uh, as somebody was asking us why we're called enough already. And I'm like, well, if you asked any woman, <laughs> um, there are many folks within a workplace that, that, you know, harassment rates have stayed the same for the last 50 years. Enough already. When are we going to actually start to actively progress and pre prevent and address these issues and be proactive in creating healthier workplaces? And not just talking the talk, but doing the hard work. Right, which is why I think our project is great because it is completely free. It can completely be customized to the workplace, um, and we're reducing those barriers. Employers just have to prioritize the conversation and realize the benefit that it can financially be smarter for them to be proactive to start to address this issue instead of waiting for something crummy to happen. Right. Um, I know there's a, a little bit more of my presentation, but let me just take a look at the rest of these questions here. Objective, objectives of the industries must be profits and power, and these are very male objectives. For the Earth to survive climate change, we need fairness, sustainability, morals, and inclusion. Can the planet survive if we allow the current male dominant status quo? Oof. You guys are bringing the questions. I am deeply, deeply appreciative. HR looks after the company and not the staff. Okay. You are not the first person to articulate that concern. I think that is where external supports and external um, options may be uh, the place to go. So whether it's occupational health and safety, whether it's the Saskatchewan Human Rights Commission or the Canadian Human Rights Commission, if you are employed by an international uh, corporation, I think, I think that's profoundly important to realize that we sometimes can't rely on our internal processes to expect justice. And sometimes there's not justice, even after somebody comes forward, even after, um, you know, a part of our work is trying to encourage people to speak up, but we recognize that's not where everyone's going to go. And that's okay. Um, yeah. These are very. Well, Nicole, yeah. maybe I can help you out with the HR thing. Just, uh, I believe in May, the Saskatchewan government passed, uh, legislation here in the province mm -hmm. uh, outlined for human resource professionals, a code of conduct and ethics mm -hmm. and a uh, reporting mechanism if people feel like the uh, 
um, HR hasn't uh, provided the level of uh, due diligence and requirements that they have, they can actually go to the governing body that gives out the certified professional HR designation. So uh, uh, to the website is CPHR. Mm -hmm. uh, I can put that in the chat if people are interested. Yeah, so there you. is, uh, now that it's legislated, the designation, they actually have the capacity to deal with uh, uh, people that from an HR professional are not meeting the requirements of the designation. That's, thank you. That's a great, great addition. I think, um, I think there have been a number of corporations that have actually been engaging uh, um, uh, anonymous complaint lines that can also be a really meaningful uh, um, way for people to speak up. Um, I, I think we've all worked in spaces where it's not safe to speak up, or if somebody speaks up, it's not kept confidential. You know, so uh, the fact that there's legislation in place to sort of create a safer work environment can be profoundly meaningful, which is why um, like whistleblower policies can be also a really helpful tool for somebody to actually uh, feel more comfortable to speak up. Mm -hmm. oh. um, one thing I just wanted to comment on um, is it, just the change of the, I think it's more of a change of attitude moving forth, but um, I spent a lot of time with my 12 year old niece and um, she was telling me some really interesting things that they actually take in school now, um, which is completely different when I went to school, um, just, just on how to approach things that are, um, she's not, you know, if you're not comfortable about, or, you know, just basically racism comments. So I, I thought it was really great to, to know that our education system is, is as well possibly, you know, upping the game a bit too on, on some of these issues that you covered today, Nicole. So I just wanted to kind of say that mm. um, I'm always hopeful of, of, you know, generation, younger generation of moving forth and being a little bit of better, kinder to each other. <laughs> well, and you're so right. You know, when it taught, when we're teaching our young boys about consent, when we're teaching, you know, when we're teaching young people about what healthy relationships looks like, um, that's extremely important work to do. That's planting the seed to sort of build those better generations, right? Um, yeah, yeah, thank you for that. That's a really great note and a hopeful note too, because sometimes this work can be very heavy. Yeah, for sure. So we've talked a little bit about, you know, education, so the importance of reporting, uh, strengthening the understandings of reporting structures. We've done a bit of bystander leadership training. Now I want to talk a little bit about existing supports out there. So there was someone, um, I think it was Jane in the chat, who was talking a little bit about experiencing uh, things um, I just want to let folks know that there are organizations that are meaningful, that are really can be helpful in, in somebody's healing journey. So uh, before we leave these, so those bystander interventions we talked a little bit about are intervene, distract, find help, be supportive, and then document. And I want to let folks know about something that en enough already it does. Um, so research shows that if you leave a job as a result of sexual harassment in the workplace, sometimes it can be quite hard to re-enter the workforce. So uh, something that we have been able to build, we have a, a team of trauma-informed employment coaches across the province that can support someone in next steps, whether that's staying in the job that you're in or looking outside that at different job markets. Um, it is 100% free of charge and you can have up to four hours with somebody. And sometimes it's uh, updating your CV, Maybe it's uh, practice runs on, on Zoom, if that's not something you're comfortable with. Um, it's really uh, survivor-led and, and survivor-directed to sort of identify what those next steps are, but it is unique in its, in its, in its kind. It's the first of its kind, at least we believe in Canada, we, when we did a bit of a search on this. So free employment for people who've experienced or been impacted by sexual harassment in the workplace. And all they need to do is just email employment at enoughalreadysk.ca or just by giving that phone number a call. And that phone number, you'll get directly connected to Vicki. And she does just a brief intake, just sort of get a good sense of what your needs are just to get you connected to the employment coach. So you'll be, if that's something of interest, you can be talking to somebody before the end of the week. 
The other thing I let, like to let folks know about is the SHIFT project that's through PLEA, which is the Public Legal Education Association. So if you've experienced workplace sexual harassment in Saskatchewan or think you may have, so even if you're not sure, just give them a call and you can walk through the scenario and find out more. You can receive up to four hours of free legal advice through SHIFT. So um, the one thing with the SHIFT project, I always like to let folks know this ahead of time, is that they will ask you to disclose your name and the perpetrator's name. And the only reason they need to know that is because they have to run a conflict of interest check within the, the law firm just to make sure that that lawyer can speak to you. So some of those um, organizations that we've talked about today include the Saskatchewan Human Rights Commission, um, and then there's the EFAP, so em Employment Family Assistance Program, uh, the police, and then that employment coaching piece, and then shift. So, oh, polling question. I should have taken the polling part out, but I do hope that we've identified, you know, if you saw harassment happening today, do you think there's something, at least one thing you could do? I, that's where we ask folks to say yes or no, and I'm sorry, that option is not available today. Uh, and the last thing is a bit of a call to action for you all. So tell your family and friends that you went to this training. Encourage them to bring it into their workplace. It is 100% free of charge and completely customizable to the audience. Uh, and I'll ask Marianne, I'll send her a link uh, to just a brief evaluation for us. Um, your feedback can be really meaningful in regards to how we flesh this out. This is all internally made um, products and our presentation. And if you feel like we need to flesh anything out a little bit more or spend less time on a particular area, just let us know. We want this to be effective and meaningful for everyone. So discuss Paul, I just have a quick question. It says about bring it into their workplace. Um, is a workplace a broadly defined term? For example, if uh, somebody's involved in some kind of a, like us, an association, then is that typically oh. what you guys would come into? It's, we've done, we've done community-based organizations, okay. large corporations, Good. small businesses of a team of three. So we're, we're open to any audience who's, who wants to have this conversation. Yeah, sorry, workplace is a very good point. <laughs> Whoever wants to talk to us, we are open. <laughs> I think that's, that's the big thing. And then follow us on social media and continue the conversation. Uh, and I think this is typically, this is my contact information. If you think of something uh, down the road that you're like, I don't remember what you said about this, or if you want further information on anything or get connected with anything, please don't hesitate to reach out and let us know. And just a reminder, our partners again are, are these folks as listed. And then this is where we usually open it up to the questions. So um, we did I just had a question come in on the chat, Nicole. Okay. Great, I'm gonna stop share right now and uh, pop open that, that chat. So what supports exist for Enough Already for employers? So we actually, so check out our website at enoughalreadysk.ca. So we have a full list of, maybe it's a workplace that doesn't have a policy. So we've got example policies listed in there. We've got sort of like a checklist of things that you can do to be proactive and preventative. Um, I'm just going to type that in the chat. Um, and then we also can uh, support them in a number of ways. So the bystander leadership training has been a really meaningful tool for employers to bring us in because sometimes they're not sure where to start. And I frequently think that they're scared of our tone, that we're just going to be like, you know, like finger wagging, that it's... Um, not going to be something that would be helpful. And I think the bystander piece is really meaningful because it's a great way for us to empower employees so, and they know that they can come and step forward when they see things. And it also provides a business the opportunity to articulate why they prioritize this work and sort of reaffirm to their staff that this is something they take seriously and, and can uh, provide the opportunity that... Um, it sort of makes them accountable. It makes them accountable because usually we'll just sort of co-present particular pieces of a presentation. So it's not just me coming in with a canned presentation that we work collaboratively with them. So within the harassment piece, we'll actually incorporate um, a business's uh, actual internal policy. So to encourage employees to sort of review that. Uh, I think we're frequently sort of like handed a policy manual when we first start a job and then 
do you revisit it until something crappy happens, right? So uh, it's sort of like reminding employers of best practices to sort of review policies so everyone is on the same tracks and they understand what is available to them for options and what's the process if something does happen. So with the other pieces that we are in the process of building is in partnership with mediation services is a workplace restoration workshop, as well as a trauma informed response to disclosure. So um, how trauma impacts the brain after someone has experienced sexual harassment can can impact how an investigator sees them if they are holding an investigation. So that very clear line of events may not always be the case when you've been impacted by trauma. So if somebody isn't retelling a story the same way every single time, then uh, sometimes an HR professional may not take them as seriously because of uh, how their uh, how the story is changing. So um, just having a better sense and better understanding as to how trauma can impact a person's brain and ability to recall um, can be really meaningful for employers. So that's something we're also working on. Um, oh, there is a, there is a please comment from Jane. Sorry, I'm not sure what we're, we're to comment to here. Sorry. Uh, women often get told that information is on a need to know level, yet information is power and I feel leaves women open to exploitation. Oof, Jane. Yeah, that's a really important reflection. So that is why these presentations are deeply meaningful because um, it provides employees to sort of hear from the employer's perspective why they prioritize this work, how they're committed to taking complaints seriously and articulating that policy if somebody does come forward. I think it can be really powerful in regards to creating that longitudinal change. We did a series of workshops in, in a government ministry um, within the last four months, and we've done six presentations in total. All were bystander related, but it provided the opportunity for deputy ministers to sort of open up every session in regards to why this piece is so important. Um, and it also provided the HR professionals the opportunity to sort of let, let their team know about what those supports are that they have internally. So we talk about that internal supports available and then the external supports if they uh, aren't helpful. So um, uh, when you, I was talking to our, our contact within the ministry and she was saying their HR department has been run off their feet since they started having these presentations. And I think it's deeply powerful that the employers are finally feeling empowered to say, oh, you do take this seriously? Okay, I think I'll, I feel comfortable enough to come forward. Or there's multiple people coming forward on a complaint to say, I really want to talk to you about something that happened. I think that sort of speaks to that systemic change, but also those small steps forward, right? So sometimes it's a small step forward in regards to curriculum and healthy relationships for young young people, and then sometimes it's a bystander workshop in in a in a, a presentation that is just an hour, but can be a serious game changer in a particular environment to sort of get people talking about a serious issue that may have been being ignored for decades, right? Ooh, thank you so much, everyone. This has been really, really meaningful. This chat is hot. I, I really appreciate the deep, deep, um, thoughtful uh, 